Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Sunday, the 19th of June. Now, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States have just recommended that all children from six months onwards are vaccinated. What do we think about this? Well, it's not for me to tell you what to do, but I am going to present the evidence straight from the relevant websites and hopefully it will give parents a better position from, from which to judge by going on this primary data. My initial thoughts would be, has the risk benefit analysis changed? Because we know that one of the great mercies of this pandemic is that young children have primarily been spared from severe disease. Not all, of course, there are exceptions, but many have. And the other thing, have they fully taken into account the potential side effects that could occur from this vaccine? We've also got the issue that in the United States, in my view, the vaccine is being incorrectly administered because they're not aspirating to avoid the potential risk of intravascular administration. And a few other things that will come to light as, as we go through. Uh, the committee from the CDC voted unanimously on this and Rochelle Walensky has signed this off. So... Um, what, what's going on? It's it's a bit complicated, so we'll, we'll go through it as quickly as, as, as we can without hopefully missing any of the main parts out. Now, the first piece of evidence I want to talk about comes from the Office for National Statistics in the United Kingdom. Now, of course, we are talking about US data. Here's the site, and it's to do with antibody studies in the United Kingdom. Now, the reason I'm quoting this is because the American data is just so uh, out of date. It really doesn't work. It's about 75% last time, last time I checked for children and antibodies. We know it's higher than that now. So even this data for the UK is out of date, but it's 95.9% uh, in children aged 8 to 11. Now, in the UK, 8 to 11 year olds have not been extensively vaccinated. So a lot of this is natural immunity. So have we any reason to suspect that the numbers are dissimilar to that in the States? I would expect they're similar to that. In other words, a lot of children have already been exposed to the virus in the United States. Now, I can't say it's 95.9%, the same number of antibodies uh, that we have in children in the UK. And that number itself is some of them have been vaccinated, many are natural immunity. We can't say it's the same because we simply don't know. All we can say is it's greater than 75%, but it is increasing all the time because we know that the infections are, are around all the time. So that, that's the first sort of question mark that came into my mind, really. Um, anyway, um, the, the, the next piece of evidence is from the FDA, which is here. Uh, coronavirus 19 update FDA authorizes Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines for children down to six months of age and there's a lot of information there again um, don't take my word for things go directly to the site I can get things wrong I can misinterpret things I'm going on what the sites say and uh, my interpretation of it but uh, quoting as many facts as we can now, they talk about the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis, which is good that the FDA is talking about that because this is one of my concerns. Uh, the FDA and CDC safety surveillance systems have previously identified increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis following vaccination with both the mRNA vaccines, particularly after the second dose. So they're not trying to deny that this is a potential side effect. But then they go on to say uh, the risk uh, is... Uh, Males, so 18 through 24 for Moderna for young men, to, uh, 12 through to 17 years of age for um, young men, primarily with uh, Pfizer BioNTech. But then they say this, and, and, and the implication there, of course, is we believe it would be less for children. Now, I don't think we know that. We believe that's to be the case. But the number of children in the studies really hasn't been high enough to flag up any significant data from this because this is such a rare side effect thankfully it's a rare side effect but uh, it does need to be taken into account a uh, direct quote from the fda again most of the cases of myocarditis associated with the mrna vaccines are characterized by rapid resolution so most of the cases with no impact on quality of life reported by most patients who were contacted following a 90-day uh, follow-up now, the thing that concerns me there really is if I had just uh, developed um, an inflammatory uh, myocarditis or pericarditis, my main risk would be that I'd be frightened to develop a cardiac arrest today or tomorrow. 
if we were still alive to report on a phone call in 90 days time i'd probably be quite happy so uh but that's not that's not commented on in the fda paper it's the acute risk that concerns me with this um but we have no data so i'm just expressing something that will concern me personally uh, 19 million children in this category we believe in the united states which is a lot uh, Moderna vaccine aged six months through to five years. Pfizer-BioNTech six months through to four years. Uh, Dr. Rochelle Walinski, CDC's director, all children after six months and older, including, interesting, including those who have already been infected with the coronavirus. Really? Are we not taking that into account at all? Are we uh, poo-pooing? Uh, natural immunity I, I do hope not i mean michelle winsk is a doctor i'm sure she's not doing that but i would have hoped for more cognizance to be taken of natural immunity and a more individualized approach to be taken to childhood vaccination this one size fits all goes against my entire um, philosophy of healthcare, which is treating the individual on an individualized basis you assess the needs of the individual, you plan their care, you give that care, and then you then evaluate the efficacy of that care. Assess, plan, implement, evaluate on the individual. This is kind of the opposite of that. Um, so that's a bit of a concern. Uh, should get a COVID vaccine, she's saying. And then she says, uh, together with uh, science leading the charge, we have taken another important step forward in our nation's fight against COVID-19. Okay. It's a national endeavour sort of thing. And, and then we, we know millions of parents and caregivers are eager to get their young children vaccinated with today's decision. They can. So that's from Rochelle Walinsky, that quote there. So that's RW. Now, if, if, we, look at, if we look at this quote here from uh, the chief of uh, Pfizer, um, we, we know that many parents in the US have been eagerly awaiting an authorised vaccine for their children under five. And we are proud to offer them a vaccine opinion so very so you know the very similar wording isn't it uh many patients in the u.s have been eagerly awaiting um michelle says uh we, we know that millions of parents and caregivers have been eager to get it's almost as if they're sort of paraphrasing each other really um but you know you could say that they're in essentially well very much very much in agreement uh, now, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine demonstrates strong immune response. Now, this is, from, um, this is from here. This is the direct uh, link I've given you as, uh, as often as I can. I will give you the direct uh, link. And there's also information taken from not only this press release, but also this press release. Um, do we like science by press release? Not particularly, uh, but it's, it's what we've got. So we go with what we've got. So that, that's from this site here. F Pfizer vaccine was 80% uh, uh, efficient in children six months to under five years of age. Now that's based on 1678 had three doses during the times of Omicron. And this descriptive analysis was based on symptomatic COVID cases identified from seven days after the third dose of vaccine or placebo as of April the 29th, 2022. Fair enough. Um, but it turns out, according to the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post, I believe both of those papers, uh, three were in the vaccine group and seven were in the placebo group. So... Um, CDC, please tell me you're not basing this on three patients in the vaccine group that got the infection. J j just tell me that isn't right, because that's what this appears to be saying. Uh, are we really basing this whole recommendation on the results from 10 patients and claiming to be evidence-based? Uh, that's what it appears. Um, if I've misunderstood something, do, do let me know whether you work for the CDC or not. But this is what it appears to me. This is based on minuscule numbers, minuscule. Uh, the trial protocol specifies a formula analysis will be performed at at least 21 cases of accrued. So they, they, they are, Pfizer are here clearly saying that they're not claiming that this is, this is valid. They're saying we need to wait for 21 cases. So they've got 10 at the moment. They need to wait for 21. Uh, but as we said, only three in the vaccine group 
got the uh, infection. What can you base on three cases, really? But they're going to wait for 21. So Pfizer, to, to be fair here, Pfizer are not claiming this is significant, that they're saying we need more data um, on their press releases. But uh, the CDC seem to be um, almost gobbling this up rather than waiting for more definitive data. Final efficacy will be shared later on. Fair enough. Uh, the other, the, and that's the other report there on the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine for you to look at. Now, the one on the uh, Moderna vaccine is just here. Here's the uh, Moderna press release that we have here. So here we have the main points from the uh, Moderna uh, press release. Six months to two years that enrolled uh, two and a half thousand patients. Two to six that enrolled uh, 4,220. Now, this is the number they've enrolled. I mean, in research terms, you'd call this uh, intention to treat. They're the numbers they, they intended to treat. The number they actually treated, they don't actually say. So the number that actually what we call the PP group, the per protocol group, um, isn't entirely clear from that. But they're the numbers they recruited. So that's sort of the most optimistic view of the numbers, really. Uh, rates of fever post-vaccine. Now, it's good that they're reporting rates of fever post-vaccine. Six months to two years, 17% got fever. Two years to six, 14.6% .6 got fever. And six to 12 years, 23.9% got fever. Now, that sounds bad, but it's actually not too surprising. This is common with paediatric vaccines that children get fever afterwards. It's the body's natural response to an, uh, uh, an immunological uh, antigenic stimulus. A fever is quite natural and, and in fact indicates that it's working really. So um, that's nothing to worry about. The fever is normally temporary. But what's more interesting, vaccine efficacy. Now the similar antibody response to 18 to 25 year olds, quite happy to accept that. But the, the, uh, the, the six-month the six uh, to two-year efficacy is 43.7%. Is Two years to six years, 37.5%. Now, we were told at the very start of this that a vaccine needed to be at least 50%. That was kind of the World Health Organization teaching and the general guidelines that if it was less than 50%, we probably wouldn't bother. If it was more than 50%, we would. These are clearly well under 50%, and yet the CDC seem to be ploughing ahead with a vaccine which really has pretty low efficacy values, lower than 50%. Um, now, next inf interesting thing, Kaiser Family Foundation um, here. They do a lot of these uh, studies. And that is saying uh, that uh, people planning to get their under fives vaccinated, 18%. Uh, definitely not getting their under fives vaccinated, 27%. Uh, that leaves a lot of unknowns, but only less than a fifth actually planning to get this vaccine. Now, what are the great and the good saying about it? Uh, Tom Inglesley, John Hopkins Centre for Health Security. There's a lot of information and trust building that needs to happen. Yep, so true, we need trust building. But then he says, hopefully with time, people will have increased confidence that it's both effective and safe. Well, so far, we have actually haven't shown that it's effective, uh, really. Uh, I don't think... Uh, Dr. Inglesby, as far as I can see, um, we've, we've, we've said we haven't really got enough numbers for safety data. And efficacy, um, well, if you count 43 to 37% as efficacious, then, then yeah, I suppose we have. Um, personally, I would question that. So um, rather broad, loose use of terminology there. And bear in mind, of course, that neither of these vaccines were tested against BA4 and BA5. These were tested in early Omicron times. And we know that BA4 and 5 are associated with very high levels of immune escape. Uh, Peter Holtz, molecular virologist, National School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, the paediatric vaccines won't hold up well in protecting against infections by the new subvariants. No, I'm afraid they won't hold up well. That's, that's a good point. But they will still be very effective in preventing children going to the hospital or intensive care unit. Now, given that that is true, I'm not sure we know that from the data because the data sets are small. But if that's true, we would have to take that account in the risk-benefit analysis. 
So the Moderna, two doses, 25 micrograms each, four weeks apart. Uh, that's a quarter of the adult dose. Now, I'm hoping if you could take that from the same vial, that would mean it's a quarter of the price, which would be which would be good. Pfizer, three, three doses, three micrograms each. Um, and the doses are given on day one, week three and two months. And that's a tenth of the adult dose. So a much smaller proportion of the adult dose. Now, the people that decide this are here. These are the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunisation Practices members, and they are all there. This is quite open and uh, transparent and a very highly qualified bunch they are indeed. Um, what's not clear from this um, release is, is how they are selected or indeed uh, deselected if the need arises. But that's then there. You can prove that for yourself. Uh, now, let's uh, compare this to the situation in the United Kingdom. Um, quite different, quite a different approach. So in the United Kingdom, um, children aged 5 to 11 years will be offered two doses of coronavirus vaccine. And the JVCI advises a non-urgent offer. And it's a slow take up. So non-urgent offer from 5 to 11 in the UK, uh, vaccines for all over six months in the uh, United States. So quite a difference, quite a difference there really. Now, um, again, the cost of the vaccine, if we're adding, this was based on 24 million people, we looked at 24 million uh, in the younger age group that we looked at before, but here we're adding another 19 million of them. Um, there's clearly cost implications. Now, we did work out as it was about three doses for um, the older age group would come to, uh, oh, that was 5 to 11's um, $1.7 billion. But someone did point out that this is the minimum because it doesn't allow for wastage. And people may open the vial and it may or not be used. There's a, there's a lot of wastage in the distribution. But there again, I'm also hopeful that we'll be able to take more doses from the same adult vials, just give a smaller amount. So that might kind of balance itself out. But important, impossible really to notice that if under fives are being vaccinated as well, that's another big chunk of change going into the uh, the pharmaceutical uh, coffers. So there we go. Um, that's the, the, the basic sort of ums and ahs really about vaccination for six months to five-year-olds and it's based on limited data so that's the data you have if you've got this decision to make that's the data at your disposal uh, it's not the data i would like to see at our disposal but it's what we have so um, parents must make that uh, decision concerning their own children and uh, thank you for watching